CBS interview, you said that information obtained in interrogations have saved lives. In September of 2011, you said that speech at Harvard that whenever possible, preference the preference of the administration is to take custody of individuals so that we can obtain information which is, quote, vital to the safety and security of the American people. So obviously you believe that interrogations of terrorists can give us information that, uh, or that could prevent attacks in the future. Absolutely. Agree. But, but you don't believe the CIA should be in the business of detention, correct? That, I agree. So who should be? Well, um, there are a number of uh, options. Uh, the U.S. military, which maintains an active interrogation program and detention program. The FBI, as part of its efforts on counterterrorism. And our international partners in working with them. And that's where, in fact, most of the interrogations are taking place of terrorists who have been taken off of the battlefields in many different countries. So there are active interrogations occurring? Absolutely. Okay. Every day. About the, about the um, foreign partners that you talk about, um, have you talked to folks in the CIA about their impressions of the quality of information we're getting from our foreign partners? Yes, on a regular basis. And they've indicated, would it surprise you to know that some of them have indicated to us repeatedly over the couple, last couple of years that I've been here, that, that the information we get directly is much better than anything we get from our foreign partners on some of these issues. Right, and that's why we work with our foreign partners, so that we can have direct access to these individuals that have been detained. Well, I'll tell you why I'm concerned. Ali An An Ani Harzi, I think is how I pronounce his name, he was, he's a suspect in the Benghazi attack, and the Tunisians detained him, correct? Uh, yes, he was taken into custody by the Tunisians. Did, did we not ask for access to him to be able to interrogate him and find out information? Yes, yeah, so, and the Tunisians did not have a basis in their law to uh, to hold him. So they released him? They did. Where is he? We don't know. Uh, he's still in Tunisia. That doesn't sound like a good system of working with our foreign partners. No, it, show, it shows that the Tunisians are working with their rule of law as well, just the way we do. Well, we have someone who was a suspect in in the uh, in the potential attack on well, in the attack on Benghazi. They didn't give us access to them, and we don't have any information from them. We work with our partners across the board, and when they are able to detain individuals according to their laws, we work to see if we can have the ability to ask them questions, sometimes indirectly and sometimes directly. So your, your point is that Tunisian law did not allow them to hold them, and therefore they let them go before we could get there to talk to and them. And we didn't have uh, anything on him either, because if we did, then we would have made a, a point to the Tunisians to turn him over to us. What, we role didn't have that. what role should the CIA play in interrogation? The CIA should be able to lend its full expertise, as it does right now, in terms of su in support of military interrogations, FBI debriefings and interrogations, and our foreign partner debriefings. And they do that on a regular basis. And so, what's the best setting to do that? And for example, if a suspect terrorist is captured, and we think we can obtain information from them, where would they go? Where do you suggest that they be taken, for example? What's the right setting for it? There's many different options as far as where they go. Sometimes it is within foreign partners. You know, they put the individuals in their jails and in their detention facilities according to their laws, right. and people can access that. Uh, we take people, as we've done in the past, and put them on naval vessels and interrogate them for an extended period of time. Okay. Is you, so you think that's the best setting is the naval vessel? No, I, us, I, I think... From our perspective, leaving aside the foreign partners for a second, for us... I think each case requires a very unique and tailored response, and that's what we've done. Whether somebody is picked up by a foreign partner, whether somebody's picked up on the high seas or anywhere else, what we need to do is to see what are the conditions, what we have as far as the basis for that interrogation, what type of legal basis we have for that. So it's very much tailored to the circumstances. When we, when we detain a suspected terrorist, the purpose of the interrogation, and I think you'd agree with the statement, the purpose of an interrogation is to develop information that could be used to disrupt terrorist activities and prevent attacks, correct? Without a doubt. Not, it's not to lay the case for a criminal conviction. Well, I think, you know, you, you, want, you want to take the person off the battlefield. You also want to get as much intelligence as possible. You don't just want to get the information from somebody and then send them off. You need to be able to do something with them. And we've put people away for 99 years for life so that, in fact, they're not able to hurt Americans ever again. Right. So what you want to do is get that intelligence, but also at the same time put them away so justice can be done. I understand, but the number one priority initially is not necessarily to protect the record for a <coughs> criminal prosecution. It's to obtain timely Absolutely information right. so we could act correctly. Absolutely right. Priority number two is to take them off the battlefield to ensure <coughs> they can't attack us in the future. Right, it's not either or, but I, I, I agree with you. Why, why shouldn't we have 
places where we interrogate people. For example, Guantanamo. Why shouldn't we have a place to take people that we obtain? Because is it not an incentive to kill them rather than to capture them if we don't have No, it's never an incentive to kill them. And any time that we have encountered somebody, we have come up with, in fact, the route for them to take in order to be interrogated, debriefed, as well as prosecuted. So where would, but why is it a bad idea to have a place that we can take them to? It's not a bad, no. bad idea. We need to have those places. And again, sometimes they're overseas, sometimes it might be a naval vessel. A lot of times it's back here in the States where we bring someone back because we, in fact, have a complaint on them or an indictment on them, and then we bring them into a Article Three process, and so we can elicit information from them and put them away behind bars. Is the Article Three process, in your mind, an ideal way to develop this kind of information? Aren't there limitations in the Article Three process? I, I'm very proud of our system of, of laws here and the Article Three process, and we, our track record is exceptionally strong over the past dozen years, a couple of dozen years, that so many terrorists have been, in fact, successfully prosecuted and will not... No, I understand, hurt. but in terms of... Our first priority is to develop information. Absolutely. The FBI does a great job. But an Article Three setting is not the most conducive to that. Right? I would disagree with that. Well, they're immediately advised about not cooperating and, and, and turning over information that would incriminate them. Uh, no. Um, again, it, it's, it's tailored to the circumstances. Sometimes an individual will be Mirandized. Sometimes they will not be Mirandized right away. Miranda, you know, Mirandizing an individual means only that the information that they give before then cannot be used in Article Three court. But, in fact, you know, the FBI do a great job as far as listing information after they're Mirandizing them and so they can get information as part of that type of negotiation with them, let them know they can, in fact, languish forever, or we can, in fact, have a, a dialogue about it. Just last point, and I'm not going to use all my own, I have a minute left. This Harzai case that I talked about, you're fully comfortable with this notion that because the Tunisians concluded that they, they didn't have a legal basis to hold them, we now lost the opportunity to interrogate someone that could have provided us some significant information on the attack in Benghazi. Senator, you know, this country, America, really needs to make sure that we are setting a standard, an example for the world, as far as the basis that we're going to, in fact, uh, interrogate somebody, debrief somebody. We want to make sure we're doing it in conjunction with our international partners. We also want to make sure that we have the basis to do it so that we don't have to face in years uh, in the future uh, challenges about how we, in fact, obtained the... What, what is that law? The you keep talking about the basis of our law. What, what law exactly are you talking about in terms of the basis of detaining someone? When you say that we want to make sure that we have a basis to... Because you said that the... Well, that's right. Well, what, based on what, which law are we talking about? Well, it all depends on the circumstance. Are we talking about law of war detention authority, which the U.S. military has? Are you talking about Article Three authority that the FBI has? Right. CIA does not have, by statute, any type of detention but authority. I, the point I'm trying to get at is, we don't. Not, the truth of the matter is, we don't know if Harzi knew anything about the Benghazi attack. We don't know if he knew about future attacks that were being planned by the same people, because we never got to talk to him, because Tunisia said their laws wouldn't let him hold them which is an excuse we've heard in other parts of the world as well. And that doesn't concern you, that we, don't, that we weren't able to obtain this information? Uh, we press our, our partners and foreign governments to hold individuals and to allow us access to it. Sometimes their laws do not allow that to happen. I think the United States government has to respect these governments' right to, in fact, enforce their laws appropriately. What we don't want to do is to have these individuals in, being held in some type of custody that's extrajudicial.